Hey guys, we are back updating the power rankings for Survivor 47 following episode 6 where they had to earn their merge. Except it was essentially a normal merge round which was pretty funny but at least a step in the right direction. And this was an interesting episode where admittedly a lot of the time was eaten up by the mega challenge here which left less time for the normal camp life stuff and set up for future storylines which does have some implications for this power ranking here but we'll get to that soon enough but we have 13 people to talk about as we some more time. Let's get into the video. So starting off at number 13, we have the merge boot of the season and here we have Rome. And admittedly, Rome was not my first pick to be in the merge boot before the episode where I said before that I probably would have expected Rachel or certain other people to be the merge boot over Rome before this episode. Though once we got to the actual episode, it became pretty apparent that Rome was being set up for a fall here considering that it was pretty much a massive dunk fest for Rome, where they don't really hide that Rome is going home here, where they don't even try to present any alternatives. They don't mention Rome playing a shot in the dark. They don't really take any of the alternatives seriously, like Annie is the backup target here. It seems like they're going all in on trying to give Rome the, like this funny farewell. And that obviously leads to him being taken out here, which is pretty interesting here. Now, obviously, Rome was never really a contender for a lot of the season. He was obviously a pretty big character, someone who was getting a pretty big villainous edit for the most part here. And obviously, that's to be expected. And considering the way that Jeff talked about him on the On Fire podcast, it makes me think he's probably going to be on 50, which take of that what you will. But if we were talking about Rome as a player as well, obviously, he's a pretty bad player, someone who was pretty bombastic, someone who obviously got pretty confident for a lot of the game here. And while he was in the majority alliance for a lot of the pre-merge, voting correctly at both of the tribals that he attends, it's kind of in spite of himself where it felt like the only reason he was in the majority for as long as he was was due to all of his advantages that sort of disincentivized people from targeting him directly there. And even then, you had people like Keyshawn wanting to target him at the second tribal that they attend, despite Rome being pretty loyal to the alliance that he had with the likes of Keyshawn and Tini there, which is obviously pretty bad there. Even after the merge, we see him wanting to work with Sam and Tiana and trying to get closer to them by revealing that Kyle was targeting them, which was obviously pretty sloppy to play there as I eventually got back to Kyle and no one really trusted Rome from that point forward. So again, it's kind of weird that in a lot of ways, Rome was seen as pretty untrustworthy due to him being like this very outlandish person, someone who was pretty chaotic, despite him like wanting to be pretty loyal and someone who was for the most part pretty straightforward with his intentions. It's just that people didn't really trust him that much. And by the end, he wasn't even worth keeping around as a shield due to how unreliable he was in the game. So again, Rome's a pretty bad player, all things considered. I think there's a number of things to mention with this game. But obviously, he is now out of the game to where he's here at number 13. And before we continue, I am once again partnering up with Russell Muscle TV to promote Idle Plays. Idle Plays is an online shop where you can purchase survivor puzzles and practice them. That way, you can potentially be the next challenge beast on Survivor 47 and beyond. In this season, we have creator lockers. These are special bundles handpicked by myself and other Survivor YouTubers, along with creator trading cards. If you purchase my puzzle, you can get your hands on the Labyrinth Ball puzzle, the Slide puzzle, and Spencer's puzzle from Survivor Cambodia. If you want to take home these puzzles and more, feel free to use my link in the description or use my affiliate code, Survivor Gumball, and start prepping now. And with that, we have 12 people left to get to talk about. As usual, I'll be ranking them based on how likely they are to win the game based on their editing and current game position. And as I alluded to in the intro, I don't think this episode was really a slam dunk for anyone. I feel like this episode didn't really give the clarity that I was hoping for, though there is some set of two future storylines that obviously is reflected in this ranking. But number 12, the person I believe is the least likely to win from this point on is still Saul. And obviously Saul wins the battle here. He is able to get one up on Rome, taking him out, which is pretty good on the surface, except what is there now for Saul? I feel like so much of his content during the first half of the season has been reliant on Rome, whether he's talking about Rome or reacting to something he did. And again, it just felt very one note. And now that Rome's out of the game, I just don't see what purpose there is to Saul's edit at this point. Now, obviously, there's a slight chance that he could get a new storyline in the future, but I'm not feeling that great about it. I feel like we probably would have gotten at least some setup to 
Saul as a person, getting to learn more about him as an individual. So I'm not feeling that great about him from a narrative perspective. And also looking forward to next week, it does look like we'll be getting a split tribal here. And just looking at the groups, I feel like Saul's pretty doomed on his group. We're considering that he's in the minority there. I feel like there's a very strong chance that he gets sniped out of the game, which I think would be pretty consistent with his edit where he is taken out like right before the jury starts, sort of similar to like a Tin Spicer from 46, for instance. So I think Saul is someone I'm not feeling that great about. I feel like there's very little upside to him narratively or edically, which is why he's here at number 12. Now moving on to number 11, and we have someone who I consider barely better than Saul, but we do have Genevieve. And I feel like this is also a pretty bad episode for Genevieve here, where despite her getting plenty of setup to turning on Rome down the road, she doesn't really get much to do on that end, where most of her content is focused on her getting the advantage early on, which by itself is pretty circumstantial, and obviously was only there because it had to, but I feel like the fact that Genevieve doesn't really get much credit for taking out Rome here when she already had the setup to do so is pretty bad in my eyes, and I feel like at this point she's probably not winning either. Sort of similar to Saul, she's also not in the greatest position in the world coming to the next round, where I think she's also someone who could potentially go out in this next split tribal here, so Genevieve's another person who I'm just not feeling great about, either from a gameplay perspective or from an edic perspective, which is why she's here at number 11. Now moving on to number 10, and this person has gone down from last week, simply because I'm just not seeing the upside for them at this point, but number 10 we do have Kyle. And Kyle's someone who technically had more to do in this episode than Saul or Genevieve here, but at the same time, a lot of it felt circumstantial, where obviously we see him like getting into trouble after telling Rome that he was going after like Sam and Tiana and that he thought Caroline and Sue were a duo there, which obviously paints a target on his back and that leads to him eventually winning the immunity challenge there and also ties into Rome's downfall even more. But I felt like it wasn't really propping up Kyle all that much where I guess the most noteworthy thing about him is him calling himself Novo Kyle, which is pretty funny. And while he does eventually get his way in taking out Rome here, I feel like it's mostly circumstantial, where obviously Kyle's gonna get this content considering Rome was going after Kyle, and they really wanted to tie that into why Rome sucks so much. But I feel like Kyle himself doesn't really get much propping up. He doesn't really get to articulate his game all that much. And we have him like telling the other people on his tribe that, He's a pretty honest person, but beyond that, I mean, there's not really much to say here. I feel like Kyle is someone who's only being shown when it is absolutely necessary, and considering that I feel like other people are being more blatantly propped up compared to Kyle, I can't really have him any higher than number 10. Now moving on to number 9, and we have someone who has technically moved up a spot, even though I still don't think they're winning, but number 9 we do have Gabe. And this was technically an alright episode for Gabe here, where he gets plenty of content getting to set up the merge, talking about how he wanted to put himself in the Mount Rushmore, sort of going back to his line in the premiere. He says that the pre-merge is like elementary school, while the post-merge is like high school, and that he's ready to graduate. And in general, this is set up to him potentially being this big force in the game moving forward. But at the same time, like, I still think the seeds are there for his eventual downfall. I feel like at this point, he's either going to be, like, the first juror of the season, or he's going to be, like, the final eight or final seven boot. I just don't see how he eventually goes on the win, considering he has been shown to be pretty overconfident, and that he's blatantly being set up as a villain compared to certain other figures who are a bit more sympathetic. So I'm not feeling great about Gabe at this point. It wouldn't shock me if he goes out at some point, despite him having an all right episode here and him being set up as a pretty big character, which is why he's here at number nine. Now moving on to number eight, and this person has gone up quite a bit since this last episode, considering they ended up surviving this round. But number eight, we do have Rachel. And I thought this was an all right episode for Rachel, all things considered, considering I thought she was going to be the merge boot coming to the episode and I did think for a moment that it could have been her when she was talking early on about how like the merge is like a lifeline for her and that she hopes she can propel herself deeper into the game maybe this could have been said to her overplaying but instead like she's able to get through this round all right which is obviously a positive in the sense that it could be set up to a future storyline of her being this underdog which to be fair could happen but at the same time there's also some missed opportunities here namely with the failure to further expand upon her alliance with Teeny and Caroline that was set up in the last episode, which to be fair, I mean, there's a lot to break down this episode, plus it was a consensus vote, but I still think that was a missed opportunity to really propel Rachel's storyline in the future and kind of makes her content from earlier seem a bit circumstantial considering she was just blindsided the last vote. So I'm still kind of conflicted about Rachel and truth be told, I don't think she's actually a contender at the end of the day, 
but I feel like considering that this was at least a better episode for her than what she's gotten before, and there's at least some potential for there being a storyline for her in the future with her having been on the bottom and losing her closest ally, I think those things are just enough to have her here at number 8. Now moving on to number 7, and this person has continued to gone down in recent weeks, but at number 7 we do have Sierra, and I think this was a pretty bad episode for Sierra all things considered, where first up you have her not even explaining her vote for Annika at the last tribal. As I said last week, I felt like there was a very easy out for her in her saying that she had to vote on Annika despite their alliance due to Annika not having a vote. Also, the whole amulet situation was not beneficial for keeping Annika around. There was definitely a way that Sierra could have explained this vote, but instead, she doesn't. And instead, Stam is the one who gets to explain his non-idle play. So I feel like that's pretty bad in Sierra's end. Also, once we hit the actual merge, we don't get any setup to the storyline of her and Sam, where you would think that with these two being major characters on the season, that they would set up how they have to play in the middle and that hey, they have to navigate all these new groups. But the fact that we don't see that is also pretty bad for Sierra here. And beyond that, like most of her content is about her wanting Andy as the backup target due to Andy being sloppy only for Andy to simply only get two votes as declared backup here. So in a lot of ways, I feel like Sierra is probably not winning at this point. I feel like this merge episode was just filled with missed opportunities for Sierra to propel herself, to propel her storyline, and to explain her actions in the game, which is usually something you would want to see from a winner in the merge episode. So I feel like for those reasons, I do have to drop Sierra quite a bit. So because of that, she's here at number seven. Now moving on to number six, and we have another person who I am very, very conflicted about at this point, but number six, we do have Caroline. And admittedly, I think Caroline's a step above Sierra in the sense that she is aligned to Sue, who is someone I feel pretty good about at this point, which I guess is a spoiler for later on the list. But I feel like Caroline's another person who feels like she's only there when it's kind of necessary to show her. Where in this episode, like, she gets to explain, like, how she found out that Sue had found the idol with the whole paint around the water well and talking about how she's happy for Sue that she's playing the game and all that's pretty good. But beyond that, like, there's also missed opportunities here, like the whole alliance with Teeny and Rachel not getting set up further, which I think is not particularly great. And I think the bigger knock is we still don't really know much about Caroline as a person, where from what we see on the show, all of her content's been about her alignment with Sue and how she's working with Sue. And considering that Sue's the bigger character, at the end of the day, I feel like that probably makes Caroline more of her sidekick, which is not great for her chances here. So while I think she's definitely hitched onto the right horse in Sue, I feel like beyond that, there's not really much to prop up with Caroline herself, which is why she's here at number six. Now moving on to number five, and we have someone who I am also slipping on as the weeks go by, but number five, we do have Sam. And I think this episode just further showed some cracks in Sam's storyline here, where for one, you technically have him getting undermined during the whole advantage hunt where we saw him and Genevieve like seeing the buoy that contained the advantage there only for him to not look for it. But then later when Genevieve ended up going back to the buoy and finding it, we have her saying confessional that you better start swimming, Sam. So obviously that's not particularly great. But I think the bigger knock to point out with Sam is him just continuing to underestimate Andy where at this point like we see him like calling in the George Costanza of Survivor. Even in this episode you have him explaining why he didn't play the idol that he didn't play the idol because he doesn't want Andy to know about it because Andy supposedly didn't know that Sam was the one to have the idol which obviously like makes Sam like seem like he thinks that he can control Andy which is kind of juxtaposed by Andy's own like content talking about how Andy's playing like this very strategic game. And I feel like with the way the story is going, I feel like I'm just higher on Andy at this point. And I feel like Andy is someone who is getting more set up to eventually turn on Sam, where Andy is the one who's kind of learning, sort of growing and stepping to his own in the game, while Sam is the one who is underestimating Andy. And I think it'll just reach a point where Andy will make this massive move by taking out Sam. So I feel like through that, that really lowers my view on Sam, not to mention the same lore issue that I had with Sierra about how him and Sierra didn't get to explain much about them as a couple at the merge, talking about how like they have to navigate these new dynamics. I think that was a missed opportunity there. So at this point, I am getting lower and lower on Sam. I probably don't think he's winning at this point, if I'm being honest, where he just seems like a big character. And I feel like the evidence is just accumulating for him to eventually be taken out here. So it's for those reasons that I have dropped Sam to number five. Now moving on to number four. And admittedly, I think this person's a little too high, if I'm being honest. Where truth be told, I feel like everyone outside of this top three are all people I have serious issues with. And this person is very much included in that group. 
But number four, we do have Tiana. And I think there's definitely some variance here with Tiana. For on one hand, I could very easily see her being the next boo, considering the whole split tribal situation. I could definitely see a world where maybe Sue takes a shot against her as soon as next week. So obviously that's not particularly great. Even beyond that, I feel like her merge episode was kind of lackluster in my eyes. For a while, she gets to talk about being excited for the merge and how she's continuing to be sus of Sue. I feel like Sue is clearly the rooting interest here. And through that, I think if there's a confrontation between Sue and Tiana, that Tiana will probably lose at this point. So obviously those things are not particularly great. But on the other hand, I think there's still some longevity potential here where if she's not the next boo, if she's able to survive the split tribal, then I think there's definitely some potential for her to make a deep run here and sort of be like this end game threat. But beyond that, I'm just not feeling that great about Tiana at this point. I feel like she's someone who, considering that she is already coming off as a big threat, where Rome wanted to align with her due to her being a shield, considering that, again, for the most part, she isn't really being propped up nearly as much as I would like. I feel like there's definitely a lot to criticize with Tiana, but at the end of the day, I feel like I have bigger issues with other people, and that kind of naturally leads her here at number four. Now moving on to number three, and as I alluded to, I feel like these top three are very clearly the contenders in my eyes. I feel like these three have a pretty decent likelihood of winning the game at this point, based off what we've seen, and it's just a matter of ordering them. But number three, we have someone who definitely has the potential to move up, but I feel like for now, I'm still kind of hesitant about it. But number three, we do have Sue. And this was an interesting episode for Sue here where we see her getting into trouble with the whole idol situation with people seeing the paint that she uh, left behind when she found the idol. You have Tiana once again being pretty sus about her. And obviously those things are not particularly great. And plus we have her once again getting set up to targeting Kyle down the road due to her not really trusting Kyle that much, which sure, I guess. So obviously there's still some things that are questionable out there, not to mention that she's one of the people to vote for Andy at the tribal, sort of going along with the backup target plan. But I still feel like Sue is clearly someone we're meant to be rooting for, where we see her again in this episode, like getting propped up, like we get her perspective about trying to cover up her tracks once the other people come to camp. You have Caroline talk about how she's playing the game by managing to find the idol and keeping it hidden for as long as she had. And also with Gabe still in the game and this person that Sue is clearly meant to eventually rise up against, I still think there's a lot of potential for Sue to become the top contender in the future. And you could definitely argue that she should be the top contender already. But I also think another knock against her is that she obviously had that secret scene in episode one where she got a lot of her personal content, which why was that not in the main episode? And while I think that has kind of been corrected since then, where she has gotten to talk about some of her background on the actual show, I still think that's something that's lingering in the back of my mind as well. So Sue is still someone who I do look at pretty highly, and it wouldn't shock me if she goes on to win, but I think there's enough question marks, I still think there's enough reservations about her that make me leave her here at number three. Now I'm moving on to number two, and I really struggle with this. I really went back and forth over what order I would go in for here, considering I feel like there are pros and cons with both of these people, even though it's the same top two that I had last week. But at number two, I am going to stick with the same order as last week. So at number two, we do have Andy. And I was seriously tempted to have Andy at number one, considering that he got a decent enough episode, at least on paper, where he gets to set up like the merge, how he got to take credit for the Annika blind side. You also have them explaining the move to use the amulets as tribal so that they don't have a target on their back moving forward. I think there's plenty to like here with Andy. I think we are continuing to see him expanding upon his storyline of stepping into his role as a big player in the season, the strategist. And plus, I think there's now set up to Andy getting one up on Sam, where I think Andy will eventually rise up to the point where he takes Sam out of the game. So I, I think there's a lot of things going for Andy in that regard. However, I still have several reservations with Andy here, where for one, I think it's pretty obvious that he's not in the greatest game position in the world, where we see in this episode that he is the backup target during the tribal, where even his closest allies in Sierra are pretty open to having him as a backup target in case something goes wrong. That's not particularly great there. But I think another major thing to point out with Andy in this episode is that we have learned afterwards that he was the very last person selected in the schoolyard pick, which was not in the main episode, which I found very strange. The fact that they cut it from the main episode instead of relegating it to a secret scene, as well as Jeff revealing this through the On Fire podcast. 
And in general, I'm very mixed over whether this is good for Andy's edit or not. Or on one hand, you can argue that it's good as it shields Andy from being in a bad spot. Or considering that the show is highlighting him as a serious player at this point, it would be kind of awkward to now show him still at the bottom and still not a great spot there. Not to mention the fact that with how packed this episode already was, that they simply had to cut this for time purposes. And obviously with Rome being a bigger focus, there was definitely bigger priorities to have than to showcase the schoolyard pick. Though I think now after seeing it play out in the secret scene, I think I am considering this a knock as we see Andy getting this confessional about how this shows him being an underdog, how it takes him back to middle school and him being rejected all the time and how like he prefers being an underdog and prefers being a wounded snake sort of slithering his way through the game. So to that end, the fact that we didn't get that confession on the show, not getting to see Andy being passed over again, and not showing him being underestimated yet again when he clearly still is, is probably more of a knock now than what I gave it credit for in the moment where I heard about it on the On Fire podcast. And while I would still consider Andy a top contender, and while I still think there's plenty of potential for him to emerge as the main character in the future, I think those knocks were just big enough to leave him outside the number one spot. And considering that this could also just be a journey edit, as I alluded to in previous weeks, I did decide to leave Andy here at number two. And now at number one, the person I believe is the most likely to win Survivor 47 at this point is still Teeny. And I thought this was a fine merge episode for Teeny, all things considered, where I felt like they had a very strong opening confessional when they're packing up to go to the merge camp, where they talk about not having a buff and not having a home, but they're excited to find a new home. And I felt it was a very good setup to their storyline of turning things around after being on the bottom for the last couple of rounds. And I think there's definitely plenty of potential for that storyline to play out. However, at the same time, I think there were some missed opportunities afterwards where despite them being part of multiple groups, they don't really get showcased at all where for one, you have the amulet group of them, Caroline and Andy. And while they get some content of them deciding to use the amulets now so that they don't have a target on their backs later, we don't really get anything from Teeny's perspective on this where it felt like a lot of the perspective was more so on Andy and them deciding to use the amulets now. And I feel like that could have been an opportunity for Teeny to hammer in that this is an alliance that is incentivized to work together. Even beyond that, you also have their alliance with Caroline and Rachel that was set up in the last episode. But once again, we don't really get Teeny's perspective on that. We don't really hear Teeny talk about how they have found this home, despite there clearly being a number of groups that they're associated with at this point. So I am kind of conflicted over how good of an episode this was for Teeny, where they get the setup to them wanting to find their home and clearly finding it based off all these groups that they are shown to be a part of right off the bat. But at the same time, I felt like the fact that they didn't get more of a focus there was definitely a reason to bump them down slightly. But considering that I have bigger issues with Andy's edit at this point, and considering that I don't think Teeny themselves did anything particularly poorly in this episode, and the fact that you can also excuse the lack of content due to the mega challenge eating up so much of the runtime here and also all the Rome stuff, I am willing to excuse the fact that this wasn't a bigger episode for Teeny at the end of the day, considering they at least got some setup to a storyline at the beginning of the episode. So at the end of the day, I still think Teeny is still a top contender in my eyes, and I feel like really it's a contest between them, Andy, and Sue at this point. And while I could definitely jumble around in the weeks to come, I feel like for now, I am still going to leave Teeny here at number one. And there we go. That will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe. Really helps with the channel. Now I'll be back again next week to update the Power Kings again, so you can look forward to that. I'm covering Hell's Kitchen right now and doing weekly recap streams of that, so you can look forward to that. I am on Patreon and have a YouTube membership, so if you want to consider supporting the channel, you can do so by clicking the link in the description. And you can also join the Discord server by also clicking the link in the description. There's a lot of stuff coming your way, but for now, that is the video. See ya.